So, well, uh, as Rob was saying, unfortunately, Chang couldn't make it here, but he explicitly told me that it, uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can please uh, email me. So, <coughs> okay, the title of the talk is Learning Transformations for Petrification Forests. So, I will begin the talk by giving a little bit of the context of what a classification with forests is. So, the basic idea is that the classifier is built, built as an ensemble of many binary trees, which are composed by two types of nodes, some splitting nodes and some lead nodes. The idea is that each of these splitting nodes is linked to one uh, weak classifier, that uh, when a point, uh, a data point reaches this uh, splitting point, it makes a binary decision to send it to the left or to the right, according to what the weak learner says. In the lead nodes, uh, what they have is a statistical collection of the different classes of the training points that landed in that specific lead node uh, in, in the training process. So while testing, the idea is that you get a new point, you run it through all of all the different trees, <coughs> and then you do the uh, you get for each tree's posterior class probabilities, and you average them in order to get the classification. So the main goal of this uh, work is to try to learn a representation that is a splitting node specific, in order to make the weak learner be uh, to help the weak learner to make uh, accurate and fast classification. So in order to see what type of transformations they learn, let's go to uh, some motivation. So it was recently uh, used that some high-dimensional data can be well represented with low-dimensional subspaces. It's well known this case where images of the same individual under varying lighting conditions are more or less fall into a low-dimensional subspace. This has been exploited by, by many methods in the literature. So what they would like is to say, okay, let's learn a transformation that uh, really makes the representation low rank. So in this case, this is simple because we know that the, the data already lives in a low dimensional subspace. However, if we consider this slightly more difficult case where the pose can vary, then even if we do phase detection and cropping, we are not going to be able to represent this as a very low rank dimension. So what they do is they learn a transformation that brings a representation that is low rank. So after phase detection and cropping, this is what they would obtain. So, if we look at this in the context of classification, that learning a low-dimensional subspace for the classes is good, but it would be better to also add some discriminability. So, the idea is to col collapse these subspaces, but also separate them from the rest. And this can be done in a supervised setting. So, let's look at two uh, toy examples to illustrate this idea. So, the first thing is, let's consider this uh, three-dimensional case in which the red and the yellow lines are one class and the blue and the light blue are the other class. So the transformation they are, they are hoping to learn collapses the two, the red and yellow and the two blue into a lower dimensional subspace and makes them orthogonal, which is the most separated they can be as linear subspaces. Another example would be two planes that are forming a, a small angle and uh, the idea is to learn a representation that would do something like this would uh, collapse them to a lower dimensional subspace and make them orthogonal. So how do they achieve this task? Uh, the idea is that, okay, let's uh, they, they solve this optimization problem in which T is the transformation, and Y plus and Y minus are matrices which have in their columns uh, different data points. So uh, the three terms here are the nuclear norm, which is the sum of the singular values of the matrix. Here the matrices are the transformed data points. And it's known that the nuclear norm is a convex relaxation of the RAM. So if we look at the first two uh, terms in this uh, objective, what they are trying to do is they are trying to minimize the rank of the representation on each class. So, um, but that would be not enough because it would be a, a very good solution to collapse everything to one single subspace and then the classes would be mixed. So, they add this other term that says that when you transform all data together, the overall rank of that cannot be small. 
take the A to kind of be small. And then they add a constraint on T to avoid the trivial solution. So in the paper, they show some properties of this cost. The first one is that it's non negative, and that uh, it reaches zero when the subspaces associated to each class are orthogonal. And it, it, it's an interesting comment that the, this would not be true if we were minimizing the rank as I was using to, to explain the idea. So the, the question now is what's the size of the transformation T? And an observation is that the target space uh, can be designed and you can obtain like some dimensionality reduction by choosing a small, uh, smaller space in the, in the target dimension. So <coughs> these ideas that, I, that they are promoting resembles LDA and they have in the paper a couple of uh, images that show uh, what's the difference between the behavior of the two. For example, going back to these two toy examples, again, the red and the yellow is one class, and the blue and light blue is another class. So what would happen is that their transformation would collapse the <coughs> classes and make them orthogonal, whereas LDA makes them uh, separable linearly in the lower dimensional space, but does not uh, enjoy this property. Another case would be the planes that I mentioned before, and what's happening here is that uh, LDA does not give a uh, good representation, whereas the, transform, the transformation that they propose uh, makes the subspaces uh, perpendicular to each other and are easier to, very easy to classify using some type of subspace model. So, <clears throat> going back now then to the trees, uh, we can see how would this be included as a representation on a particular splitting node. So, <clears throat> given a, a splitting node, what they do is they randomly divide the classes into two groups that they call I plus uh, I minus I. So, this randomization is, uh, the, the objective of, of this randomization is to avoid in the forest to have repeated uh, trees. So, then they learn this transformation following the model that I explained. And after the learning, so they can approximate these subspaces that now are low dimensional, they can approximate it with a, dictionary, with two, a couple of dictionaries, V plus and V minus. And, and then they, at each node, the with, with learner will be composed by the transformation, so that's the representation, and then two projection uh, operators onto these uh, learned subspaces. So the with learner that they use uh, is of the following way. So uh, uh, when a test uh, set arrives to a given split node, then they compute the representation and then do the projection and select the one that produces the smallest error. So uh, one point to note here is that after they do the training, the cost of the weak learner is very uh, small because the projection matrices are already pre-computed. So <coughs> Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some results. They tested this on the synthetic data and also on some real uh, applications. They used MNIST that is not shown here. They also used the EL extended DLB face detection, the 15 scenes, and the Kinect data, which uh, has uh, death images from uh, body, uh, human bodies in several positions. And the idea is to try to detect the different body parts, I think. There are 19 body parts and factors. So, <clears throat> first, some quantitative result. Here, the idea is to show how the, uh, the, the power of the transformation learned in, in, in the tree. So, at the very last, the very last uh, row is their work. And we are comparing accuracy and testing time. The testing time is, on, I believe, in about 1,000 images. So the, the point is that this is not a forest, this is just a single tree, and they want to show that even with a single tree, by enhancing this uh, representation at the splitting node level, they can achieve very good, uh, very good uh, accuracy with very little time. The time that they have is more or less equivalent to some other random forests with other type of weak learners, but they obtain a, a, a much higher uh, accuracy, of course. If you add uh, some 
trees to the other, if you, if you add some trees to the other uh, algorithms, then the accuracy gets comparable, but at the cost of some uh, higher running time. So, well, let's look a little bit what's going on. So these three rows are, each of them correspond to one splitting node in the tree. The very first one is the, is the root. And the idea is that in the figure A, the first one, there's, that's a three-dimensional embedding of these 38 classes of the different faces. And as you can see, there are many colors, which means that under this projection, they are all mixed together. So then they randomly select half and half of the classes, and that's what's shown in the figure B, where you have all the, uh, the red and the blue classes. And then the uh, third picture, number C, is uh, then the, a three-dimensional embedding of the <coughs> representation in which one can see that the inter-class variability is uh, increased and the intra-class variability is reduced. The last column is just the first component of this representation, which can be seen already that is quite discriminative in, in all three cases. So the first one is the root node, and the second and third are from the child nodes. So, then, uh, increasing the number of trees also uh, increases the accuracy, and this uh, the, so, but increases also the testing time linearly. So, the uh, idea to show here is in these three datasets, NIST and the 15 Sims and Kinect, uh, you observe uh, the, the expected behavior. So, and finally, to I wanted to, they wanted me to talk to you about some extensions they are working on. Uh, the idea is that this can be simply generalized to the multi-class setting, in which uh, you have more than two classes. And basically, the extension is straightforward. It's just uh, instead of having two turns at the, for, for, the, for the two classes, you have as many turns as the number of classes. So. An example of this uh, would be, okay, let's say if we have nine uh, facial images for nine subjects, so again we have a three-dimensional embedding of the original data set and all the classes are uh, arranged in this uh, all over the space and then when you uh, learn these transformations you can see that the images are mapped into nice subspaces. So, to conclude the talk, the idea is that they presented a simple way of learning a transformation that significantly improves the performance of random forest, particularly making uh, stronger the, the weak learners. Then, uh, they, this can be applied to diverse settings of clustering and classification. I believe that they have some extensions that go in this direction, that probably are on the archive. And uh, uh, finally, they have answered some of the theoretical questions, but there are many, many more to be answered, and uh, they are pursuing that at the moment. So, okay, uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, so, do you know uh, how they prepared this projection map versus some of the sort of entropy based? Um, you know, techniques that normally use these decisions. Uh -huh. Yes, well, what I understand is that the, uh, at the, so, so at the level of the nodes, <coughs> the cost in flight on both is very similar, and I, I believe that they are competitive or <coughs> Any more questions? No. Okay, well, let's thank Pablo. Right, so just to say, um, so